thank you so much for coming out. I have that terrible allergy stuff, so I can't I can't hear myself a little as well as I'd like. But you you'll trust that I am having great thoughts, right? Um, I want to thank uh, WNYC and Green Space for hosting us this evening and for being so gracious in their interest. Um, it's my great on honor, really, to inaugurate this series called The Way We Live Now with two poets who encapsulate the idea behind that title and the reality of the times with something greater than wit and narrative verve and, of course, poetic license and truth. That might seem like a lot to live up to, but Brenda Shaughnessy and Michael Dickman more than match that criteria because of all they put into their work, which educates me and fortifies me and others emotionally and intellectually. Brenda and Michael are both published by Knopf, whose poetry editor, the stupendous Deb Garrison, helps usher in worlds that are not, that are, if not actually American, become distinctly so in their concerns and visions. A little biographical information. Brenda was born in Okinawa, Japan, and was raised in Southern California. She went to the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she majored in women's studies. Subsequent to that, Brenda got her MFA at Columbia University. She's a professor at Rutgers, and Michael is also a professor, but at Princeton, where, is he, where he is a lecturer in the creative writing department. And since both schools are in New Jersey, the state has an embarrassment of poetic riches to choose from if you want to study poetry, and I hope you do. Michael is from the northern part of the world where Brenda was raised, Portland, Oregon. There he, was <coughs> there he lived with his brother Matthew, also a poet, along with other family members. Michael and Brenda are out just now with their fifth volume of poems each. Brenda's is called The Octopus Museum and Michael's Days and Days. Um, each questions the very notion of how we live now, and I'm so honored and pleased to be able to ask them more questions about that very grand and real statement. Please join me in wel welcoming these two stupendous artists. for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm thrilled because I love your writing so much without being envious of it, which is a very freeing <laughs> uh, <laughs> impulse for an interviewer. Um, it's so not, um, there's nothing about it that can be imitated, but, but it, there's a lot in it that one can aspire to. And I think that that's one of the great things that a poet can bring to the table, which is uh, aspiration. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start with a sort of personal note. And um, it's been wonderful to realize that um, we share an editor, my former New Yorker editor, Deb Garrison, mm -hmm. and, um, and who is now the head of poetry at Knopf. And I believe this is your first publication with that company um, yes. and that particular editor. Maybe? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, can you tell me something about your individual experiences with her and, and uh, the, the making of these books? Because each, um, it's a very interesting, uh, have interesting formats that remind me of the most sort of complicated LPs that I would get when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, that there are many, many stories, but one sort of um, subjectivity that holds it all together. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think it bears talking about how the books came to be assembled. Mm. Um, Michael, first? Sure. Well, first, just, um, I mean, Deb is um, a, a, a dream editor or person to work with or mm -hmm. be near, um, uncompromisingly intelligent and um, uh, caring and present and supportive and bolstering. Um, I am... Um, uh, you know, this book, Days and Days, um, uh, 
similar to other things that I happen to have written, um, just sort of uh, slowly accumulated. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of subjectivity or feeling, overall feeling that you're talking about, like some things that I was making would feel a part of that, mm -hmm. though not in a, not in a, like a project, but just in sort of almost an abstract sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you were writing, you were writing poems, um, not thinking of it as a co cohesive whole. You were just writing the poems. No, just writing the poems. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Yeah. And then I would say, and then I sent at some point I sent a group of them to uh, Deb and said, you know, would you, she's always been very kind to me. Um, mostly just in our, friendship together just saying no <laughs> and, um, then I sent some and then <laughs> that just won't do and she's like no, these, thank you so much for sending these absolutely not. <laughs> yes. um, but then there was something about these I suppose and the timing worked out and she um, was for them and uh, and and so then I just kept making stuff mm -hmm. and getting rid of stuff and then suddenly there seemed to be a, um, a kind of a whole ta uh, taking shape. And is that... But it's uh, so abstract to it talk is, about. It's abstract, but it's also sort of a... Um, it's a soul response, really, to the writing. Um, when you know um, something is done. Um, for instance, I have a friend who wrote a short story, and she'd finished the short story, and then she started reading Wordsworth, The Prelude, and she read the whole book, and then she realized her story was finished. Um, mm. Not because of Wordsworth, but just because of the time, right. the emotional time that it takes. So what was the emotional time for your book? How long had you been working on those poems? I mean, I, was, I worked on them for, from the first little bits and pieces, which is how they are made, to handing it all in um, four years. Mm-hmm. And what do, Michael, do you, um, when you're writing, um, let's call it verse, because I'm old, I can say that <laughs> word. Um, when you're writing verse <laughs> like that, are you also reading a lot at the same time? Are you reading a lot of verse or a lot of um, prose? I, I read a lot of, of everything. So I read, um, I, I'm, I tend to like write like four or five poems at once. Mm -hmm. And then also read, um, I mean, you know, I'll read 10 books at the same time. So like right now I'm reading two cookbooks, a book about um, uh, cherry blossoms in Japan in the 1920s, mm -hmm. a couple books of poems, a novel, a book of short stories, a book of interviews, like a, so a lot of <clears throat> things because it feels good to jump around for me yes. or for my brain or something yes. to different things. And so I would have been writing, I mean, reading a lot of different things at the time, but not necessarily um, like one sort of one thing that was sort of leading me towards my own work, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, writers often use reading as an excuse to run away from writing as opposed to running toward yeah. writing. And that's, I'm, I'm charmed that you're running toward writing when I, I just don't even want to do it. So there yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. There's, I won't remember the name of the poem, but there's a great line in a John Ashbery poem that says something like, I'm going to write for 20 minutes and then I'm going to read something that someone else wrote. Yes, it's that wonderful Renata Adler line from, um, I, th I believe it's uh, um, Speedboat, where she says writers, um, the phrase writers write is specious. Writers don't write. They telephone. They <laughs> gossip. They complain yeah. about writing, but they rarely write. Yeah. Um, That's correct. So one of the things that I, yeah. I love about both of you is that you give me hope about productivity. <laughs> um, because five books of poems, and I'm, I'm not going to give your ages because people don't need to know that, but five books of poems for any adult is, is quite a stupendous achievement. Brenda. It helps to be, you know, Ambidextrous. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I wanted to um, ask about your experience with Deb and coming to Knopp. You know, <clears throat> you're reminding me, Michael, that Deb rejected me once two years and years ago, but it was such a nice, kind, lovely, like, just like, it made me feel good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, she, by Deb. she cares about me. Yeah. And it, it did, it's, it's stuck in my mind years and years mm. and years later. Um, for me, the book really came about as a, 
response to the 2016 presidential elections. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just, I, I was beset by um, nightmares. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I'd wake up, they'd still be happening. <laughs> and um, so these, these became sort of dystopian scenes. Um, but what I would do was I would go to a paradise. I would like figure out some way to go to a McDowell or a Hawaii or something, someplace like that. And then I would let it rip. You know, because when you're in your daily life, you kind of have to keep it together. You know, I have these kids and to teach class and you have to sort of, you know, function. But I'd go away and I would fall apart and I would just write and write and write and write. And they would be the just the scariest things I could imagine. I'd say, you know, better out than in, like just get it on the page and don't think about it anymore. Um, But it it felt incredibly poisonous. Um, So when I went to Deb with this like stack of poison papers, it was an email. It wasn't really a stash. <laughs> um, you carried your satchel up the stairs. <laughs> still had that sort of radioactive yeah. poison feeling. And she was really, really open-hearted. And when I sort of lost faith, which I did several times in the process, she was so encouraging. She was mm-hmm. just like, no, this is um, uncomfortable for you, but it's, it's good for the book. So, you know, we'll carry on. And she had no problem telling me what to cut. Mm. And, you know, she's also quite... Um, and it's not just all nicey nicey. It's like mm-hmm. right. it was really, really it's very, business. really, really strong editing. Great. What is it? What is it like when you have um, someone who, whom you trust, um, and also that person who's giving you shape, giving you shape as an artist? I mean, you, Craig, Brenda's husband is a poet, and I wondered always what it was like to have poetry be part of your domestic atmosphere. Um, I'm sure the same for you, Michael, where it's part of the conversation. Um, It's part of what you share with a partner. What is it like to live in a sort of domestic sphere and then go out into the world with the poems? Well, I ended up stealing a title from Craig without realizing it. (laughs) Um, I had a a poem that that I called Map of Itself, and I was sort of like proud of that title, and I was like, hey, and he's like, that was mine. <laughs> oh, so I gave him credit, but I was like, can I, can I use it? He's like, yeah, fine, I'm not using it. So he let me, I guess that's a perk. Yes, you know? <laughs> yes. But um, I don't, I don't, it's not as heavenly as it would seem. I mean, I don't take criticism very well is the problem. Right. Um, I'll take it from Deb, but not from like a guy. <laughs> you know? um, and being edited by a woman was the first for me. That's it's definitely it, there's definitely a uh, it was it was that was great. And um, yeah, sometimes we just have too much to for each other to read. It piles up. You know, I, mm. I need to read this. His manuscript he needs to read mine, and we're busy, mm. and we don't, and then sort of take it personally. Mm-hmm. And you're and Math. Um, sorry, excuse me, Michael. You had um, mentioned how your brother Matthew, um, how his hands were all over a lot of your poetry because of what you share sure. together, not just as twins, but as <clears throat> twin poets. Is that something that still goes on now that you're not living in the same state? It does, yeah. I mean, my brother and I started writing poems at exactly the same time in high school. Mm-hmm. And so he's someone who um, he's seen every draft of every single poem that mm-hmm. I've ever written ever Mm -hmm. and um and it's an amazing um it's an it's an amazing experience to share a poem with him because he has seen everything else he can get to a critical place um so quickly uh and without any niceties or needing to feel like oh i hope i don't hurt michael's like he doesn't really care about my feelings mm. at this point, and, um, which is a relief, you know. So mm-hmm. um, I, uh, I w- it would be very strange to write a poem, let alone share it out in the world before he had, mm-hmm. before he had seen it. And my wife, also Phoebe, um, is a brilliant uh, reader and writer herself, and also. Um, an uncompromisingly intelligent uh, critic and will go through a poem and, you know, point things out um, that I couldn't see or didn't want to see. Yes. Uh, and it, it always is a new poem after that. I think that great editors like great psychoanalysts teach us to grow up 
faster mm. than we would if we were by ourselves. And one of the things that I love about both of your uh, books and your writing in general is how it's the evolution of a style that's going on as, at the same time as you're talking about very important issues, for instance, um, white crime and poverty in Michael's early work and Brenda's um, work about the ways in which memories become commodified and owned by a vast group of people and what does that mean in terms of the eye and personality. Um, now we're in a world where destruction um, has to find some sort of hope or the books don't really exist at all. Um, and I was wondering about the fact that but while both of you have written personal poems, you go about it very differently. Can you tell me something about the development of your styles and what drew you to writing poetry in the first place? Um, I know that's a really impossible question, but you're gonna have to answer it. <laughs> um, I started in high school, too, and um, forgot that I had started in high school. And it was sort of, it came back later, decades later I realized, oh, suddenly I remembered when I, when in high school it became very serious. Um, was it was it a, was a sort of aha moment when you were reading something or reading no, a poem? No, it was going to um, it was going with my speech teacher and my speech team to a tournament at Berkeley mm -hmm. and going to I think it was Cody's books and seeing Berkeley Poetry Review and thinking for the first time I had never seen a literary journal before and I mm -hmm. thought oh oh you can write a poem and then put it in there with all the other poets and people might read it buy it at a bookstore and read it. And um, I really wanted to be in Berkeley Poetry Review. Yes. And I memorized it. And then, like, 20 years later, I ran into a poet who was in that issue. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, you're so-and-so from issue, you know, 29 from <laughs> spring 1987. And he was just like, backing away. <laughs> I don't know who you are. Yes. Did you end up in the Berkeley Poetry Review? Uh, I have poems coming out there for the first time, like, right about now. Congratulations. <laughs> well, it's a long, long dream. <laughs> <Let's have> a, <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But I also think, too, you know, I, I had a pretty a pretty typical sort of artistic development in that. Tell, tell us a bit in about that, it. You know, tell I us just, a bit about California, actually. I was completely incoherent. Mm. I just had no, I couldn't say a word. I couldn't say a sentence. I didn't know what I thought. I was just a valley girl, and I was trying to be serious, and I didn't know how. And, um... You know, I loved I, I, the, the serious wordplay of someone like um, E. Cummings really drew me in. I thought, like, oh, you can play that hard yes. with words. And, um, and the fact that you could talk about sexuality in this way that was not completely obvious was very exciting to me. Um, and I thought I could sort of, um, I don't know, express sort of sexuality in poetry, I don't have to come out as queer or anything. I could just sort of like right. say in the poetry and then live life. Um, were, you, were you having queer feelings by then? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, the, and then the first book is all very much a sort of, you know, uh, just like a bunch of lesbian clusterfuck poems, really. Right. and. Yeah, and then things change. Then uh, the more I realized that, oh, I have a voice, I want to use it for something that might be legible in some way, then yes. things changed. And, and then with my third book, like something really, really sad and bad and scary happened to me, and I wrote about that. And the, pr the practice has been deepening and changing as I live, yes. you know, and keeping pace with what happens in my life. And I think that it's um, that you use poetry as a way of keeping not only a sort of personal record, but a p political record. Um, oh, yeah. Um, that it is about, each book of yours has been about the successive change that happens to your body, the female body, and um, the body of the world mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So when I read you, I'm always looking not just for Brenda, but for the world. And when I read Michael, it's very interesting because I don't, I've only been to Portland once in my whole mm. life, and I had a terrible flu, mm. and I stayed at the Ace Hotel. Mm. And it was a lot of fun listening to people in the other rooms have fun. Mm -hmm. And so that was my experience <laughs> of mm -hmm. Portland. But, oh, and I went to the Japanese Rose Garden, which was dead, of course. Right, was, yes. Um, and that was amazing. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that I 
um, learn reading you is about a, a segment of society that I don't know anything about mm. um, emotionally or politically, but there it is in your writing, and it's very, very powerful um, in the way that when I first discovered um, um, Lucia Berlin or when I first discovered people like that who lived, mm. or Jean Rees, mm. people that were living on the margins of other societies. And I always felt, I always feel when I'm reading you that you landed there by mistake um, <laughs> and that as an alien you're taking notes <laughs> in this world, that you are of it, I mean about it but not of it. So can we talk a little bit about that aspect? Um, one of the things I love about it is similarly, you know, not knowing anything about the South, <clears throat> Uh, the modern self and finding that in Flannery O'Connor, that mm, there was the mm. junk of the world there. Mm -hmm. And it was her job to excavate, to find beauty. Yeah. Um, so I have those feelings when I read your writing as well. Yeah, I mean, the I, I grew up in um, in Portland, but in <laughs> the... And I'm, I love Portland, and I love being from Portland. Mm -hmm. um, and Portland and the Pacific Northwest large is the... Um, tuning fork yes. for anything that I make. Um, the neighborhood, I grew up in deep southeast Portland, if anyone here or listening knows it, um, out on like 92nd and Foster, which is far from the Ace Hotel. And, um, <laughs> and, and Portland in the 70s and the 80s was not like Portlandia. It was. Um, no. you know, I tell. I tell people. It's this. Will also, sound I've like never a, seen so many stoned people in my life. Yeah. In no. City. It was this shitty town. Yeah. And um. And I tell people it, it's really not a joke. Like we, like grew up in Gus Van Sant's Portland. Yes. Which is it, 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 it rained all the time, and there was heroin everywhere. Yes. And um, the our neighborhood probably would have been. Um, a fine kind of suburban neighborhood, but they built um, I-205 through the middle of it. Okay. And once the freeway was built, then the whole, then everything just fell apart. And up until... And your mother was a single mother. My mother was a single mother raising three kids. There's that wonderful quote where she says, um, she's, th she's being told that she has twins, and she says, I don't yeah. want them, yeah. Yeah. because I, I'm, not, I'm only going to pay you for one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And yeah. she, she brings you home, and she said, Michael would be crying in one room, and Matthew in the other, and yeah. I'd be on the porch crying. Yeah, so. yeah, and, and smoking a cigarette yes. between her, between yes. her tears. Um, but growing up, it was, um, you know, it was a working class slash lower working class, dangerous, beautiful place to grow up, mostly... Um, working class white families struggling with lots of different things. It started to change. Um, by the time I was in high school, um, everyone was welcome to the neighborhood. You just had to not have a lot of money. And so right. there was a black family living next to us, a Vietnamese family on the other side. Um, and uh, but, but that place is so... Um, important to me and to my imagination, I think. I can mm. be back there, oh, I can be back there physically in seconds if I just close my eyes, like smelling things, feeling things, etc. cetera. Um, and I think even somewhere, even in the poems in this new book, Days and Days, those poems also come from that place, mm. even though it, they're not as clearly about um, that place as poems in my first or, or second book mm -hmm. if that makes any sense complete like. sense and um it's a perfect segue to um say that place is so prevalent in what you've both written and um i'm wondering brenda if you wouldn't mind reading um this first section from there was no before taking arms against the sea of troubles from your latest book right so this is um do you feel the need to set it up or do you want no, to just I read i don't need to set it up okay that this is the poem where the octopuses take over. There was no before. Take arms against a sea of troubles. Before health insurance, there was health. A pre-existing condition before the weird paper cut on the neck had you eventually getting around in a wheelbarrow pulled by a gentle mule named Sinister. Sure, it's metaphoric. Also true. When I say you, I mean me 
Who else can I talk to? Before you were born, the world got along hopelessly without you, lonely without knowing why. The sharp edges of bird song scraped across the sky, gay with fever, no way to bring it down. On the ground, houses were called homes, and homes were called living spaces, and they dotted the sick countryside, those near dead spaces. Dead spaces were called cemeteries back then, too. Dead air was what the interred watched on TV. Everything was a show, which must go on and on, continuing in sleep rehearsal space. In the morning, our dreams were still a mess. Nobody knew the blocking, gels melted onto the hot lights, and we could hardly sit through the thing. In waking life, we set our lines or broke character or looked directly at the lens and were entertained. We binge watched ourselves till we believed daybreak was a rerun and the stars a quiet new kind of crime drama that had inaudible singing in it. Beautiful. Thank you, brother. <laughs> um, when, I, when I listen to you um, read that poem in a number of poems, your voice in my head, reading your book. Um, I hear anti, great anti-war poems like uh, poets like Muriel, Muriel Rukeyser mm. a bit and Marion Moore's What Are Years, mm. um, the question of how do we survive. Um, what are you seeing um, in this world of the Octopus Museum? What does the Octopus Museum mean? The Octopus Museum means that we did not slow our roll and we destroyed the oceans, and then felt strangely uh, regretful about that and figured out a way to house octopuses on land after which they took over. So basically, we might have destroyed ourselves as a, as a, as a species, um, but we didn't quite. And the octopuses are sort of now our overlords, and they are creating a museum of us, which is what this book is. It's all the exhibits, um, fragments, pieces of art. Um, exhibitions, collections, um, archives, uh, what our late capitalistic, um, uh, hell-bent on destruction, even self-destruction uh, species was like at the end. Um, so it's the second worst case scenario, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. I couldn't bear to think of what, would really, what we were really going through. I created a kind of intervention, you know, mm. where these guys kind of come in and we kind of go, well, I guess this is better than total annihilation. Right. In the, in the notes of the book, you mentioned two books that were very important to you um, that you were reading at the time, comp composing the, the work. Peter Godfrey Smith's Other Minds, which is a book about octopuses, which is amazing. Mm. Um, and they're basically their evolution. Um, that they're so different from humans uh, molecularly and, and, and evolutionarily that they're basically aliens to us, um, space aliens. Um, what, are some, what are some fun facts about octopus, <laughs> if you can remember? Well, one fun fact that completely almost ruined the whole book was that they only live between two and four years. Wow. I thought, how are they going to take over if they <laughs> are if they're toddlers? You know, I don't really understand. <laughs> but I solved that problem by making them have intermeshed intergenerational memories. Because right. um, it's creative writing. It's imagination. You can do what you want. <laughs> um, but I did, use some, I did pull some science. Um, and that book, Other Minds, was extremely useful. Also, the stuff about shells. Sort of like when shells were developed by... Um, sea creatures. That was sort of the beginning of resistance, um, when someone had to actually defend themselves before they didn't have to. Um, and the other book was Emily St. John Mendel, Station Eleven. Um, there's a poem in the book that is um, extraordinary, where you go out into the sea with the other women. Um, you're visiting a place, and um, there's a, a moment um, where you're you think you're talking about refuse in the sea, um, that there's a paper, I think it's a plastic bag or something mm -hmm. that you see, mm -hmm. and that there's no differentiation between how you feel um, and what that waste is. Mm -hmm. um, are you, as a human, wasteful of this beautiful place? Mm -hmm. Would you mind reading a little bit of that poem? Um, this is Identity and Community? Yes. Um.
I don't want to be surrounded by people, or even one person, but I don't want to always be alone. The answer is to become my own pet, hungry for plenty in a plentiful place. There's no true solitude, only, only. At Seaside, I have that familiar sense of being left out, too far to glean the secret, how go in. What an inhuman surface the sea has always open. I'm too afraid to go in, I give no yes. Full of shame, but refuse to litter ever, I pick myself up. Wind has power, sun has power, what is power's source? There's no privacy outside, we've invaded it. There's no life outside empire. All paradise is performance for people who pay. Perhaps I'm an invader and feel I haven't paid. What a waste to have lost everything in mind. Thank you. Mm. Oh. <laughs> um, Michael, I'm very um, taken by um, days and days, and it has so many physical experiences that resonate for me. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, this idea of traveling and not being home and being displaced and how the body sort of has to make a home wherever it is, including absorbing a lot of junk in the mm -hmm. process. And I was wondering about that junked world in hotel days and I, wouldn't, I would hope that it's not too much of a burden for you to read a couple of pages mm -hmm. from it to let the people know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> uh, hotel days. Eco pillows float above the standard queen, a dream in off-white. Oh, you can buy these same pillows in the lobby, poked through with goose feathers. The noise in the hallway is not quite noise. A towel draped over the TV, and even though it's not my home, I move the furniture around. A visa card slides open the exit at a cruising altitude of 30,000 feet. Air conditioning and Xanax are the same thing. Alive all the time. I think I'm going to be sick. Afraid of early checkout, the continental breakfast and neighbors through the walls or room service 24-7, afraid of room service and starlights, the soft whirrup whirrup of an ice machine, the soft whirrup whirrup. Large foam takeout spacecraft containers overflow the garbage in the bath. You can't call anyone from this phone, can you? Clean sheets need a haircut. Remote control needs a haircut. The room smells of lo mein. The pool stays open until 10. If you don't have a swimsuit, they will give you one. It's a new poem by Frank O'Hara. Elevators reach up inside themselves like trees and do their tree arms. A bird here, a bird there. Employees change the welcome mat three times a day unseen. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening. The noise in the hallway is business. That first moment when you walk in and flop down on the bed is pure chemical relief until it isn't. On the 100th floor, a twin pattern helicopters down a carpet without end. High windows. On a clear day, you can see whatever. Mm. It's beautiful, and I'm, I'm going to burden you with one more. Um, if you wouldn't mind reading um, Prescription Days. Oh, sure. <clears throat> and I'd like to talk about it a little bit after you're finished. Sure, yeah. Uh, this poem, uh, like Alton said, um, Hilton said, is um, uh, Prescription Days. Um, there are f a couple different kinds of days in this book, and this is uh, one of them. Uh, prescription days. Every 10 feet opposite the new faculty housing, inside my tree-lined mind, an automatic sprinkler. It's going to be a beautiful day, and so are you. Crack the ice tray, and dandelions degloss 
their preschool yellow voices, freeze-dried and recently vacuumed. No thanks, I don't drink. The morning is external light and juice, ice in a cup, spoon balanced on the tip of your finger. I jump for joy among powdered pastels and hear my teeth. Everything else waits. The loops in the front yard wait where every piece of grass whispers, hold on a minute. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to. I wanted to. I wanted to dig a little bit into prescription days, um, um, and talk about this idea of of altering the self, of chemicals or external things that alter the self. That happens a lot in your book, um, whether it's this chemical release of sitting down in the hotel bed finally mm -hmm. after a lot of travel, or um, um, something that m alters the mind. Um, can you tell us a little bit about prescription days and how that ha might have a relationship to ho the hotel poem? Because I think they do. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, very much so. <coughs> just in, <coughs> excuse me. Sure. I mean, just <coughs> in the way that that um, that you that you that you say, like um, I, my my twin brother Matthew Dickman, who's a poet, loves. Um, he won't mind me saying that he loves hotels, mm -hmm. and I absolutely hate hotels <laughs> and um i'm just thinking maybe it's from watching the shining growing up or something <laughs> but like there's something i find very creepy about it and also just about myself in a hotel it's mm. so strange i never really want to be away from my family like i've talked to some writers who be, you know they're like oh it's just such a relief you get to sleep in and um but i don't care about sleeping in and um and so when i'm in a hotel like if i've gone someplace to do some work or reading or something i find it such a strange disconcerting yes. experience deeply so you have to run downstairs and ask to use the printer in the office to oh, print your speech uh, out and oh man and yeah. it, and i often will get like um sometimes i'll get like a migraine and then i'll be in the hotel and like not sure which hotel i'm in yes. and um and but the, then, the flushing and there are some <laughs> like some hotels are, and some people like this, but like you could be anywhere. It's yes. like being at a Target store. Yes. Um, I halfway expect to walk in in one city and walk out and be in a different city. That would be yes. amazing. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. <laughs> well, it'd be amazing if you could pick. Yes. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but then prescription days are is a little bit like that. It's an altered state. You know, um, I had um, the boring a slightly boring answer that's connected to it um, is that I had um, ankle surgery mm -hmm. and for like a dollar I was given huge bottles of opioids oh, for wow. the post-surgery mm -hmm. um, pain to deal mm -hmm. with the pain and I was eating these opioids and thinking a little bit like oh I don't quite understand in a really stupid way, I thought I don't quite understand this epidemic because like, I don't feel great. Like I don't feel, you know. And then a friend of mine said, well, they're just doing their job. You should take a bunch of them after, you, when you're not supposed to. And then I did like have like one when it was like all over. And I was like, oh, this feels amazing. This is what it was. This is, and it reminded me of, I used to be so scared to fly and I would get Xanax from my grandmother mm -hmm. and sometimes I would lose track on like how many Xanax I had eaten and then I'd be like walking around the Detroit airport like like proposing marriage to the guy at the McDonald's who got <laughs> me a vanilla uh, like fries and a shake and mm -hmm. I'd be like I love you so much um, but that sort of feel like it's feeling a feel of being it's a feeling of <clears throat> it's a feeling of being um, unobstructed emotionally. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and also this feeling that is not <clears throat> really true of, of like, yes, being unobstructed emotionally and also connected on a cellular level to everything around you from people to sprinklers to grass. Um, also... But isn't that interesting uh, that that's what poets and writers do anyway? Yeah. <laughs> right? Is that they sort of develop... Um, empathy for th for that which they are not, and so perhaps what the drug was doing was just sort of amping up 
what was already there anyway, dangerously. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah could be definitely. Um, I hope you stop. Oh yeah, I brought okay. them back to the. You can just drop them back off at the um, at the store, and they, you know, the pharmacy will just take them back. That's how. That's how loose it is. That's how loose it is. Wow. And uh, I don't know what they do with them, but you could just hand them back. Yeah. But also, I find living in the suburbs of Princeton, New Jersey, also a very strange experience. Um, I was you, there once when I was 18 and I was drunk, so I don't remember. Yeah. What's it like? Everyone has lawn service. Like, oh, wow. we grew up, like, the neighborhood I grew up in was really quiet, except for an occasional fight or something between neighbors or you know, um, couples and... It's a world that's very rem far removed from where you grew up. Very much so. Yes. Huge lawns where, like, other you hire other people to come and do your yard work, and um, there's always, like, a buzzing sound. It's very strange. What is... Do you think that this will inform the world of the poems that will come? I th subconsciously, I, th I would everything guess that does. everything does. Yeah. yeah. And back to this point that you made about the domestic, um, about not wanting to be away, um, Brenda's written an amazing poem about going away too bright. I love going away from my family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bye, suckers. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brenda, do you mind reading that a bit? Yeah, which one? Um, it was just when you get to McDowell and you're worried about Cal. Oh, well, yeah, that, I mean, that was not really in the poem so much, but... Um, yeah, I was at McDowell, and I had, you know, moved heaven and earth to escape my family and, um, pr you know, get them all taken care of and everything. But then I was at McDowell, which is totally paradise. And um, I couldn't write. I just sat there every day for hours with my pen against the blank page. Just it, nothing was happening. And I was so mad at myself. I mean, mm. I just was like full of self-loathing. I couldn't <clears throat> handle this. But it was because I had this block. I had this scene in my head what, before I had escaped my family, I had thrown a party for my six-year-old at a gymnastics place. And I had the pizza and the chicken tenders and the like chips and the cookies and the fruit. I bought all this fruit because I thought we should be healthy. We should have healthy snacks for children. Yes. And like, my kids won't eat the healthy snacks ever. But then I look over and there's this kid who's just like scooping just jillions of blueberries into his mouth. And I was just like, Jesus, Henry, how? And it wasn't my kid, it was some other person's kid. And <laughs> I was just like, wow. And I, for some reason at McDowell in New Hampshire, I couldn't stop thinking about yeah. this child. Like just, I could, so many blueberries. I mean, I bought a huge thing of them. It was just like, <laughs> like a shovel. Um, and I'm like, I can't write anything until I just sort of have to write this thing out just to get it out of my, my system and move on from there. So this is, um, so I wrote blueberries for Cal. So Cal is my son, um, and he uses a, he has cerebral palsy and he uses a G-tube to eat, so he's not the kid who's going to be scooping blueberries like that. But it, it causes a pang, you know, it really sort of... Um, so this was the poem I had to write to, to, this is the poem I didn't want to write that I thought was trivial and domestic and not mm. interesting, which is why I had to sort of get it out of the way. But then I wrote it and, um, and it found a place in the book. This is Blueberries for Cal. Watching little Henry, six, scoop up blueberries and shovel them into his mouth, possessed. I'm so glad I brought blueberries. Wish my kids could, would eat them. Cal can't. Simone won't. Henry's sisters, Lucy and Jane, took turns feeding each other goldfish crackers and sips of juice, arms around each other's neck and back, tiny things. I wish my daughter had a sister like that, and my son a nervous system that let him walk and munch berries. Sometimes I can't bear all the things Cal doesn't get to do. I want to curse everything I can't give him. Admire, compare, despair. That's not the most real feeling I'm feeling, is it? I feel joy in Henry's joy. Blueberries for the child who wants them. There's all this energetic sweetness. Enough to go around, to give and taste and trust. More than enough. For Cal, too. I want to remember this. My children seem to subsist on music and frosting. Where there's frosting, there's cake. Where there's music, someone chose to make a song over all other things on this earth.
I'm curious about the idea of, you know, um, the domestic poem being trivial or the feeling um, that's attached to it being trivial. What does that mean? Does it, it just mean, means is that it something that as a woman poet it's expected of you? Yeah, or? it just means that like I worked really hard to get away from them. Yes. <laughs> so, like I did my party, I did the thing, <laughs> they are all fine, presents, yes. everything, and I and now it was m- mom's time to like be free of it all and just you know, drink wine at dinner and talk about art and then go home and write for six hours. Um, That was supposed to be, so yeah, it was supposed to be leaving that other thing that takes up all my time and attention, leaving it behind so I could live my other life. Um, So yeah, it's not that I don't think it's real, it's just that it's all too real. Um, And I like to think other thoughts besides, you know. um, Well, you have other thoughts. I mean, you know, one of the things that's powerful about the book is that it has, there's a multiplicity of, th- of thinking that goes on in it, and it, that goes on in your writing in general. Mm. Um, there's the story that you're telling, and then there's the story about the story, mm. often. And so I was wondering, as professors, and I'm going to ask Michael to read one more thing just to surprise him. Um, <laughs> as professors, when you, come, when you meet young students who are sort of as hungry to know about poetry, um, as you were and are, what is it that you're teaching them? Are you teaching them technical things about sonnets and sestinas? Does that still exist, or is it a different way of teaching now? I mean, sonnets and sestinas still exist, of I course. mean, as a way of teaching poetry. I mean, are the, are the young poets just as hungry as we were? I don't know. I try to give them everything I love. And then they sometimes I don't want it and they throw it back in my face and <laughs> I feel like I should dig some other kind of dig something else up that I love. I don't know. Yeah. But there but I, yeah, I mean I, I feel like trying to show them poems that will help them realize like, oh, poetry's about like expanding what's possible to feel and think. You know, that's what that's I just want them to read anything. It doesn't matter what it is, that can give them that sort of aha where they go, Oh, I I can use this to to think more thoughts, think more deeply, think more, more complicated things, feel uncomfortable thoughts, feel things I never felt before. And I could use poems, I could use reading poems to get there. If they, That's all I want them to, mm-hmm. to get. Because mm-hmm. that's all I think you need. And is, it, is, it, is there such a thing as the poetic imagination where someone w- who comes to your class, let's say, and you know that they're prose writers, but they're trying to eliminate, whereas a poet has a lot that they feel is in the white space and in mm-hmm. separating lines, you know? For prose writers, it's, it's something that you want to fill as opposed to take away. Mm-hmm. Do you ever run into that with certain writers, young writers? I mean, sometimes just the suggestion of a, of a sentence fragment is like, dynamite for their imagination. Just mm. like, you, can, you don't have to have it be like a full thought. It can just be a, a stutter or a one word sentence or a fragment and that can hold its own on the page. Mm. I, I think that's quite liberating. Um, but I don't prescribe any one way because no. I think even you know a, a long prosy line can be poetic too. I mean, if someone's just like, doesn't have any poetic imagination, it's just like read more. Don't try to write. Right. <laughs> How about you, Michael? I, I mean, simil- what are you handing over to those kids? Similarly, like we, you know, at Princeton, the creative writing department is undergraduate only, mm. and so it's rare actually to get someone who self-identifies as a poet. I'm a poet. I do, you know. And we also, um, everyone's invited into the workshops um, from any academic. Um, uh, Background. So we have kids who are writing coasts, we have kids who are doing neuroscience, kids who are doing math, etc., mm-hmm. um, who sometimes are writing poems for the first time in their lives, and certainly reading contemporary poems for the first time in their lives. And for me, the class at its, like, with the poets that I work with, the class at its most basic is just, and I think this is really just what Brenda just said, but it's a way to develop an intimate relationship with language and figure out ways to have that relationship continue throughout your adulthood. Mm -hmm. And that the class can be a kind of self-defense against other kinds of language out 
in the world and they're inundated by stuff as all of us mm -hmm. are social media ad it's campaigns etc mm -hmm. um and that connecting with with poems um uh for me especially contemporary poems is a way to um maybe develop a stronger sense of self and imagination and ways of feeling and um and they get to explore that i think in the and also on the side of that just um trying to get them to be comfortable with mystery in mm -hmm. art which is something that we something make. that's lost is, is in education and it, given the times as nuance gets mm -hmm. thrown right out the window it, it really is yeah. and it's taken for granted in other really important places i mean i believe like if you go to church on sunday you have to be comfortable with mystery mm -hmm. or you wouldn't why would you go or if you're studying uh um, black holes or you know mm -hmm. mystery is a part of that you mm -hmm. stand next to it and you deal with it and then suddenly with art w we're taught to throw up our hands and say I don't get it I feel hustled by it or mm -hmm. I'm not smart enough or poems are presented as uh, you know I could go on but anyway but just trying to get them to be comfortable with just standing in front of a poem that they may not be able to explain to their parents mm -hmm. and just receive something from it mm -hmm. and be comfortable doing that if you could also do that in adult romantic relationships, <laughs> that would be great. You know, so there's a way where you could maybe find a way through poems to other kinds of being. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the things um, I think we're a little bit over, but one of the things that was crucial to me um, as a teacher was hearing how imprecise the language was generally about politics, and one of the things that both of your books brings um, to the fore is the absolute necessity for um, precision when it comes to political thought and action, and also where we come from and where we're going, not just as a nation, but as individuals. And Michael, you, in Lake River Stream, which is this magnificent close to your book, um, you talk about where you come from and about the world being what it was, um, that there, it wasn't, there were no questions because it's what you knew. Mm -hmm. And I'd love you if, um, I love you anyway, but yeah. I'd love I, if you could I read you. Um, page 71. And um, to um, the end of 73, the good news is graffiti? Sure. OK. Um. For a long time, I would cut the grass in the morning before it got too hot. For instance, the basil burned, ditto the oatmeal. Growing up, I never considered a different kind of life because we had television. It doesn't seem that long ago. A swimming pool in the living room, white reverb. I used to take off fast, but now I take off slow. More a migraine than anything else. Something dull in the bushes. Is that a rabbit? A dead squirrel whirly gigs the light. That light was cling free. For instance, a Coke is nice, something to look forward to, and you can do it by yourself. The day knows exactly what it's doing opening a stuck window or collecting a small fee. But also, you see something out the window I don't see. Moss grows, you can count on it. Morning dew scratches at the door, then canters away into what we're not sure of. I filtered everything through rain. I got what exactly? More rain? The good news is ferns. The good news is graffiti. Those peonies probably weren't even peonies. Probably they're dahlias. Mm. Um, one of the things I want to, before we open the floor to questions, is I want to say um, how important it is for us as teachers to um, insist um, that students read as much as possible and as widely as possible and also current events as widely as possible because so much of the conversation that we have is ill-informed and also nuance gets flattened mm. um, by reaction and mm -hmm. so my goal in the fall will be to give students your books and say 
okay, here's the New York Times and the Financial Times and the mm-hmm. Guardian, and here's Brenda's book and Michael's book, and now just go away and think about mm-hmm. what you're saying, listen to what you're saying. Um, a long time ago, Alice Neal, the great portraitist, went to a, a school, an art school to give a talk, and she was in her 70s and mm-hmm. just, just starting to make a living as a painter. And um, she said, I think this was the period of lots of um, strife in Chile and Pinochet, and she said, isn't it terrible what's happening? And they didn't know what she was talking about, and she just exploded, and she said, you can't be artists mm-hmm. without knowing what's happening in the world. And so thank you both for bringing the world to us and I hope inspiring those students to, to go out there and read and understand more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a few um, minutes. If, if anyone wants to ask a question or um, feels inspired uh, and unafraid, um, or is just completely silenced by our brilliance and wants to go home, there's that too. There's Helga. Hi. <laughs> oh, she didn't. <laughs> did you have a question, well, dear? That's funny. I did not have oh, a question. Oh, sorry. But <laughs> I was just <laughs> Helga Davis, great singer. <laughs> <laughs> now I have the microphone and feel, you know, that yes. kind of pressure. Yes. So here's a question, and I've asked you this question about ritual, about what it is that you do every day that feels uh, like a thing or a practice that is practical, not just to what you do, but to who you are as (coughs) people that you might share with us that we could take away. Hmm. Uh, Me too? Everybody. Okay. I don't have anything. No? I mean, I don't do anything. I always feel like I should have a schedule or I should... I mean, there are some things that I have been doing lately that I feel like... It goes on my list of things I should be doing every day, but don't. And But two, but they are watercolor painting, which is new. Um, I love oh. doing an art that I don't have to be good at. It's like, I can suck at this. It's fine. Yeah. Um, I can make mistakes. I can go out of control. I'm like, this is ruined. It's not... Who cares? Um, and also um, singing. Just I really like singing because it. Um, again, I don't have to be good at it. No one hears it, and it's. Um, it's. I don't know. At least I'm not afraid of myself. But yeah. I wish I could do it. I mean, if I did it every day, I think I'd be a lot more balanced and, you know, jaunty and <laughs> able to move faster and like n- not fall downstairs and stuff. Yeah. Um, but, but. Yeah, if I do, thank you for reminding me to do it more. We have a friend in common in Paola Prestini, too, by the way. I'd yes. love to talk to you. Yes. Michael? It's such a relief, also, yes. to give yourself permission to not be good at something. It's yeah. tremendous. It's such a relief to give yourself permission to not be good at yes. something, and that that doesn't stop you from doing it. And I think so much of how we spend our time is worrying about how not good we are yes. at right. things. And to hear someone, it means something very different to us to hear from, from someone like you yeah. who is excellent at something to not be excellent at something. I mean, I think I, I know I'm bad at sex, so, but that doesn't <laughs> stop me. <laughs> <laughs> just Hilton, just keep trying. You just okay. have to keep trying. That's the that's the that that's the it. whole point. Yeah, is read to, less. Is to keep just just keep, keep at it. Yeah, <laughs> Michael. I I I wish I had a, a ritual, um, and I don't. Although I wonder about it. Uh, I was talking to some of the poets that I work with at Princeton the other day about mm. um, just being aware of your body as a writer, and it's something that. Friends of mine who are dancers, it goes without saying. Friends of mine who are actors, it goes without saying that they would be in touch with their bodies as a way of beginning new work. And I tend to sort of sit like this and, you know, like, and so, um, 
but I haven't solved that problem yet, but just trying to become, you know, aware of it. Um, and then I also... You mean aware of the physical... Of, yeah, like, mm-hmm. of me in my... Like, this is me in my body. I'm about to do something physical. Because so much of it goes here. Exactly yeah. right, yeah. yeah. And um, it's why I've been so... I've all my adult life been um, jealous of friends of mine who are studio artists who work in spaces mm-hmm. and they stand up and they listen to music and they, you know, friends drop in and out. And that often doesn't happen or it doesn't happen for me as a, as a writer. My kids run in and out. Mm-hmm. But, um, but then I also, sort of along the lines of what Brenda was saying, I also, um, I would never sit down and say, now I will compose a poem. I have these notebooks that I carry around with me and little snatches of things that pop up into my head, I will write them down. And sometimes like magnets, they'll start to speak to each other if I'm lucky. Mm. And then those become poems. Mm. Even something like hotel poem, I mean, hotel days, like um, I didn't, I wasn't in a hotel thinking, I'm going to write about this hotel. It was just these bits and pieces of Mm. things that I became aware of and then made something of it. Um, um, sex aside, I think that w- the thing that I um, that I find very important is to hear um, to hear language that I don't understand, even if it's English. So often that sound for me is um, television, mm. um, and it's the thing that I don't really watch. Um, I listen to while I'm doing something else, and I like to listen particularly to Wendy Williams in the morning because she's not speaking English. Mm-hmm. She's speaking kind of Wendy. And, um, and then I, I'm tidying up while I do that. And because I'm sort of pr- propelled often by guilt, um, it gives me that entertainment. Mm. I can get entertainment out of the way mm-hmm. and then, and then um, go to work mm. after a couple of hours of... Mm-hmm dusting and Mm -hmm. oh where's that book I have to fix the bookshelf and all of that Mm -hmm. stuff Um, it's just something that I have to do on a fairly um, regular basis because I think um, prose is such a different animal too and uh, revision is really where I think I find writing not the writing but in revision Mm -hmm. but you have to have something to revise Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Young man, um, I can barely see anyone. Hi. How are we going? Good. Excuse me. Um, it kind of goes right with what you just said with revision. How do you know? How do you switch between optimistic, this first draft of something that I'm writing? I love it. I'm proud of it. I got it out. It got it out of the paper. When yeah. do you invite the self-critic back to the table to to work on on making it better and stronger? How do you know when to kind of transfer mindsets? Um. God, she's never invited. She just comes. <laughs> she just crashes. Yeah. And she's the rudest girl. Ugh, she's so rude. Yeah. <laughs> I, I uh, honor your question, um, but I've never felt good about anything that I've written. <laughs> um, and writing has never made me feel good about some, something bad in my life. It's never been therapeutic for me. I lost my older brother. He killed himself. I had these dreams. I ended up writing a book of poems about these dreams. Not once did I feel cathartic, good. Um, That's like an extreme version of it. But then just like the things that I'm reading now, like um, I always just have this feeling of like curiosity maybe uh, or wondering like, oh, I wonder what this is or what this might be. Like I don't know what this is. And, And then keep keep going and it's always sort of for me anyway like moving towards a kind of abstract very uh, shape and a sound that I don't know yet but I think I might find and then I might get close enough to it but I w- you know I've never had that experience I mean not since I was in high school really like ha- um, my, my twin brother and I argue all the time about he talks about how he, he'll say things like oh, I just I want to be more happy in my life. And I would say, like, you're an adult. Mm. Why, why is this even a happiness? Who wants to be happy? But um, anyway, uh, yeah, so um, I'll stop talking now. No. 
No, I think what, you're, what you mean, or might mean, Michael, is um, happiness as a kind of all-inclusive word doesn't really suit existence. Uh, also, as a pursuit, um, right. I worry about it. Um, but I also, but I haven't, I don't have that experience where I write something, a rough draft of something and think, oh, right, yeah. like, mm -hmm. you know. I'm um, happy. I'm happy about yeah. this, and now I hope I don't mess it up. It's mostly, like I said, for me, more like, oh, I wonder what this is. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it'll stay like this or change. So curiosity, mm. even though it's like not enjoyable. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not painful. I mean, let's not, you know, people call it work. Have you got any work done? But, um, mm. yeah. I'm sorry, this young woman, I believe. Um, Brenda, you mentioned in your early <coughs> California days your writing being um, inscrutable because you were taking everything so seriously. And I, I want to ask all of you, um, maybe you encounter this less now and maybe you, you did earlier, but like the, the, the fear, have you ever had it that what you end up putting on the page is just not going to be legible to other human beings? <laughs> and uh, how did mm. you... What mindset do you get into to work through that? I'm th I think that all three of these questions are related. I feel like I, I've been writing for a long time and I feel like I've, I always say to my, I always really beat myself up about this sort of non-existent practice that I have. Why don't I have a set writing time? Why don't I have these certain rituals? Why don't I have that like candle put at two o'clock and sort of, you know, everything aligned just so? Why don't I have this down? Shouldn't I have this down? And uh, I think the, 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 the question that you asked about sort of when does the uninvited rude girl guest come in who sort of tell, you know, the, 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 the Revisa, mm -hmm. is that her name? Um, <laughs> I love that. Uh, but <laughs> she, like, I don't know when she's coming. I don't know when the poem's going to get good. I don't know when I'm going to get to it again. I don't know anything because I can't know because if I knew it, it would be done. Every right. single freaking poem has to be written from scratch without knowing what I'm doing. It's utterly maddening. I mean, if I were, if I, if I, I mean, that's why visual arts are so fascinating to me is because you can like do a water wash. And There's you something know what the evident. Is. There's something evident. Yes, and with this, I every single time it has to be re, completely started with coming. I, mean, I know a couple of things that I know I can do with words, but then as soon as I know how to do them, that that pattern is too. It's been used. It's a, now it's a crutch. Now I'm using it over and over again. Um, has anyone ever got, have you gotten obsessed with the blank of blank construction? I did a whole book of just those, you know, the, the microphone of truth, the, mm. uh, the book of water, the, you know, you sort of get, you, you realize I can, I can put anything in there. And you start making these little shortcuts and little tricks and you realize like, I'm not doing this fully. Um, mm. So I don't know how that relates to your question now. Um. But it did. You just have to, I mean, basically, it's just beginner's mind. It's, it's just, you mm. have to go back to not knowing what you're doing every single blank page, every single time. It's terrifying. And I don't think, maybe it gets a little bit easier because I find that there's a corner, a little glimmer of, like, fun or intrigue and not just terror, not just terrifying blankness. But, um, but when the stakes are really high, it is, it is sort of a... Um, it's almost an adrenaline, like shock kind of energy that's that's starting it. I don't know how exactly to explain that. Well, you, you recognize that it's something. You recognize it as yeah. something. It might not be good. Good is not even the no, question. No, no, no. I mean, it might but be the recognition factor. If I'm lucky, it's hideous. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's just, it's just you know, powerfully bad, powerfully awful, the worst thing ever. Because at least it's not just boring, right? Mm -hmm. Michael. I mean, the part of the question <laughs> that I might of this, the part of the <laughs> the part of the question that I might answer is just the, to say, um, and it's different for uh, lots of people, of course. But I don't imagine anyone reading these things that I write, ever, ex uh, truly. I mean, except uh, my brother, um, who is still uh, who's a reader, but not my audience. I don't. Uh, that's I mean, a beautiful distinction, actually. But some people, and I, and I, I've. I've it's great. Like some people have a real sense of who, quote unquote, their audience is and think of an audience and they care about them. They care about their well-being and sharing something with them. And I think that's 
great, but I don't, I don't experience that at all. And so I have lots of problems, <laughs> concerns, but one of them is certainly not whether anyone will understand these things I write. It's a about. different wound. I mean, the, the wound that you were describing is the wound of the performer, right? There can never be enough people right. to satisfy that demand to be looked at. Um, whereas writers, um, it's a different, it's a different sc scourge. Scourge is that? How do you pronounce it? Scourge, scourge, sure. um, who's internal, and so he or she or Revisa or. Mm -hmm. um, Robert the Rude Guy, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call him, or it, um, exists really centrally in the self mm -hmm. as opposed to outward mm -hmm. validation for something. So it's a confusing thing because you publish a book which is an outward thing, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you will find your people through that book. Mm -hmm. um, what you're finding is the self, and that's really what, is, what we're attracted to and what we need. Thank you for being essential to, to my life, certainly, and, and to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.